podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the US and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Dylan Fox. Dylan is the founder and CEO at Assembly AI. Dylan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Dylan, let's start with yourself, please. Could you give us a, an overview of your journey in technology from where you got started, some of the roles you've held along the way, and take us up to the day when you launched and founded Assembly AI? So I was always into computers and video games as a kid. So I was always really around computers growing up. My brother was also into computers. So I had built some very basic HTML CSS websites when I was like in middle school or elementary school or something, hung out on IRC channels, <laughs> trying to find other people that were playing these games that I was playing at the time. And then I think that interest always stuck with me to do stuff with computers. So when I was in college, I started working on college startup with a buddy of mine. And as part of that project, as part of that startup, I uh, feel like I shouldn't even call it a startup because it was very much a college startup. But as part of that startup that I, I worked on with my friend, I built all the software for that product that we were building at the time and taught myself everything and went to some meetups in Washington, DC, where I was going to college and then living at the time. And that really solidified for me, my interest in software development and programming. And so fast forward a couple of years, I ended up, the startup didn't work out obviously. And then I ended up taking a job out in San Francisco because I knew I wanted to be part of tech and that's where tech was. This is like 2014, 2015. I took a job out in San Francisco where I was a machine learning engineer on this team at Cisco systems out there as part of that job got really into machine learning and then AI and neural networks and eventually left Cisco to start what I'm still working on today, which is assembly AI, which is our company. Now we're doing a lot of really cool stuff with neural networks and AI models and making those available to developers and other companies through our, our API platform. So I'm happy to talk about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Let's jump straight into that. Well, firstly, thank you for the background. Great to learn about your own journey. So firstly, tell us all about assembly AI, who you are, what you do, mission of the business, and, and then talk to us about uh, the early formation of the idea behind the business. At assembly, what we're doing is researching, training, deploying, and then hosting at really large scale AI models that help developers and product teams build AI first and AI powered products and entire companies. And today what that looks like is we've got a series of models that we maintain, host, deploy, that help customers, what we say, transcribe and understand audio data with AI models. And now we're starting to do the same thing with text data as well. So to be specific, we have models for automatic transcription of audio content, content moderation of audio content, summarization, automatic chaptering, PII redaction, entity detection, something called an embeddings model. And so developers and product teams can basically push audio and video files as well as text documents now, which is a pretty new thing, to our API. And they can basically say, apply these models to that data and then send me back the output of those models run against the data I submit to our application where they then will build a feature on top of it. And so we run these models at extremely large scale. We're doing like millions and millions of API calls or hitting our servers every single day and making their way to the different models that we host in our infrastructure. I want to 
jump straight into some possible use cases because when you and sure. I were speaking off air previously, you were talking about just how impactful this can be for organizations and why it's such a difficult problem for them to tackle in house. So, give us some examples of what where are you seeing this in terms of industry application use types of companies and just how, how much time it's saving. Right. We are seeing applications across a wide range of use cases. So I'll talk about one media companies with a lot of user generated content. They're pushing that user generated content, audio files, video files through our APIs, and then getting back lists of topics that are discussed, lists of uh, content that should be moderated. That's maybe talking about hate speech or violence or gambling. They're also getting back transcriptions. They're getting back summarizations. And they're using that data to do a number of things. One could be automate their human trust and safety team. So let's say you've got 100 teams, 100 humans looking at all the user-generated content that's uploaded to some app that is flagged as potentially being harmful or hateful. Um, that data can now be run through our models, through our API, where we can then give a score as to like, yes, this was actually harmful, this one was not, and that can automate this, this human workflow. So companies are building these automated trust and safety workflows on top of our content moderation API. We then have companies serving more targeted ads into media, so video files or podcasts or other user-generated content as well, based on topics that are found to be discussed in an audio and video file, for example. In complete other industries, we have a lot of customers in the contact center space. And so we have companies building these AI powered features in contact centers. So features to automatically summarize phone calls between a customer and a support rep to automatically detect the sentiment or emotion of a call. And then to use these contact center platforms or using that data to basically make the users of their contact center platform, which are usually managers or sales managers, more productive and effective as they're trying to find patterns across like, you can imagine huge volumes of conversations that are happening between customers and reps. And so the kind of, there's a number of other examples, kind of trend we're seeing is that, and this goes back to one of your earlier questions, like Genesis, the idea and how it's matured since. When we started the company a couple of years ago, we saw that audio and video data was becoming a bigger and bigger part of a growing number of applications on the internet. So dating apps were adding audio and video messages, podcast usage was exploding, virtual meeting usage was exploding, voice over IP use cases were exploding. The pandemic really increased the pace at which this was happening and like this usage of audio and video and, and online internet products was exploding. But as part of that, product teams then were looking at all this data that they couldn't really do anything with. And they were trying to unlock it so they could build things on top of it, uh, build high value features or products or services on top of this audio or video data that was being either created in or uploaded to the products that they were building. And so you can imagine if you're like a video conferencing platform and there's millions of hours of video conferencing happening on your platform, you can build so many features on top of that data. If you have the tools to unlock it, like summaries of video meetings or automatic action item detection, automatic compliance monitoring to make sure certain things aren't discussed on video calls in certain industries. There's so many applications. And what really, what we really wanted to do was give product teams and developers the AI building blocks to go build all of these cool applications and features on top of this audio and video data that was being created at growing volumes on the internet. And so where we started was automatic transcription models. This is like four years ago now that could just unlock this data. So at least companies could go do things on top of text, like sentiment analysis themselves. And then where we matured to and grew to is offering a number of different models like content moderation and topic detection and summarization that operate on top of the transcribed text that our automatic transcription model can generate. We're basically exposing all these AI models to help these companies build features on top of audio and video data that's being created in their products. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. 
When you're looking to scale your team, or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. Dylan, you've talked about the building blocks that you're creating and how it can be used by these developers and engineers. I want to start with your own team, the team of developers, engineers, data scientists. Could you describe what it's like day to day for our audience if they were a member of the team, what a typical project looks like, and then how that segues into the end users and how it all comes to the point of impact? What we do is we work really closely with our customers and developers that are building products or features with our APIs and the models that we build and train. And through that close relationship, we try to identify what are the common use cases that customers are building with our models and our APIs. So like one is conversation intelligence. There's a ton of products that are being built to try to make sense of large volumes of conversations between customers and customer support agents and the contact center space or between customers and small businesses and in marketing technology space um, between there's just a ton of applications in that space like virtual meetings and so through those relationships we then try to identify what are the areas of research or models that we could build and research into that could help our customers or developers build the next like billion dollar AI powered feature, AI powered product on top of or with. And that really influences a lot of our product thinking. So that really influences a lot of our product thinking where we will then organize research around to see what's possible. So we have a large team of AI researchers at the company and groups of those researchers will coalesce around different project ideas we have for models we want to build or problems we want to try to solve. And then we'll start usually with like literature reviews. So we'll go out there and we'll look at all the current research and papers and research that's been conducted in a space that we want to look into and use that to really start to influence our opinions and experience around what's possible, what we might be able to do, where we want to focus. And then from that, we'll really start to do a number of experiments and design what those experiments will look like, how long they will take. And we know that as an AI company, a lot of research is trial and error. And we're really trying to like de-risk that as much as possible, but still there's a ton of trial and error that happens. So we will start doing research, try to get some sort of research direction showing promise and working, and then just continue to iterate until we feel like we're at a point where all right, we have a model that is going to be worthwhile to put into production as like a new feature, a new model for our developers that are using our API. Or we'll get to a point where we'll realize, okay, the state of the art in this area is not good enough yet for this model to really have strong product market fit. So we're not going to focus on that. We're going to shelf that and come back to that a bit. So it's a very like collaborative process because unlike traditional software engineering, You can't just design the thing and then go build it, go build it. You have to, with any type of machine learning, it's a lot of experimentation and trial and error. Dylan, staying on the topic then of your own team, when you look at the roadmap over the next 12 to 24 months, what sort of positions are you going to need to fill on the technology side in order to further service the increase in demand for the platform and adding new features? What sort of opportunities are there going to be for people to come and join you on this mission? So we always are looking to hire more AI researchers to our team so that we can do more experiments, research more areas that we find interesting, that we want to launch products around. But really, there's a ton of engineering that goes around the research to train large models across multiple nodes, to train models on large amounts of data, all the pre-processing that you have to do, crawling of data that you have to do. So. There's actually like tons of engineering work that goes around the research. And what we're seeing is like a two to one ratio where like every researcher really needs like two research engineers that can work around them and help train models that are larger and then try to optimize those models to be able to get them into production. So we are really focused on 
adding more research engineers to our team that can help accelerate our research velocity, our, our training infrastructure, so we can train more models at large scale. So the research engineering piece is actually becoming like a very large piece of our team and one that will probably continue it to invest pretty heavily in. So then final question from me then, when you look at Assembly AI's journey from when you first launched it to where you are now and the ever growing demand for automation when it comes to audio and video and text, there's a huge potential for your industry. When you look at what's possible and what you're working towards, what are some of the things you're most excited about for the next chapter of Assembly AI's journey? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think when we started the company, there were a lot of AI powered features that companies were building. So they'd have their products or they'd have their applications and then they would tack on this AI powered feature. So maybe like an Apple launched a visual voicemail, right? Like these small AI powered features. What we're starting to see are these AI first products where the entire product or application is built on top of the AI models. And if you take away the AI model, there's no product or service. And that's really exciting because I think now that these AI models are getting better, like automatic transcription is really good, approaching human level accuracy, automatic summarization is really good. There's a lot of really powerful prompt-based large language models out there now. There's obviously this explosion in these text to image and now text to video models that are happening. You're seeing, I think, the next generation of these AI first products and applications launching and that is going to be a huge opportunity. And I think a lot of people are paying attention and we're really excited about that and being able to support those AI first products with the models that we're creating and the APIs that we're putting online and serving at large scale that these companies are going to be building on top of. So that's been really exciting to see unfold. Dylan, thank you so much for coming on today and talking to us. It was great to learn about your own background and your journey to launching Assembly AI. Fascinating space that you're working in and an incredible use of machine learning and automation to help organizations process large swaths of of data. And obviously with the trend of data creation, this is only going to continue to be a, a bigger problem that needs solving. So we wish you, the team and everyone at Assembly AI the best of luck in months and years to come and look forward to having you back on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate you having me on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Aldis Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.